Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. My name is Michael Lynch, and I'm Chief of Education here, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you to tonight's Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. First of all, to all of you who have been with us for quite a while, welcome back, and a special welcome to our students from DEE who are joining us for a short period of time here on, uh, on Carlisle Barracks. We're, we're uh, thrilled to have you here and glad that you took tonight to uh, join us for tonight's lecture and hope you're able to attend uh, a couple more on your, your repeated visits to Carlisle Barracks. We are thrilled to begin tonight again. We all know that we began this year, uh, 2011, with the 150th commemoration of the beginning of the American Civil War. And tonight, we have one of the scholars of that war to uh, bring to us yet another aspect that perhaps some of us, especially myself, need a bit more education about. Dr. Wayne Wei Sheng Shed is assistant professor at the, of, of history at the U.S. Naval Academy. He's currently on sabbatical from the history department and is currently in, and is a Henry Chauncey Jr. 57 postdoctoral fellow in Yale University's Grand Strategy Program. He is currently writing a book on the origins and implications of the idea of war as a rational instrument of policy. Between June 2008 and July 2009, he also served with the State Department as the TWO's satellite lead for the Salah Adin Provincial Reconstruction Team in Iraq. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Wayne Schiff. All right, uh, I assume everyone can hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, th thanks, of course, to, uh, to Michael Lynch uh, for inviting me uh, for this wonderful venue. I also want to thank Dr. Summers. Uh, sort of, there are generations of Civil War scholars who have come through this place and, and been able to use uh, him as a resource uh, and, of course, the, the wonderful documents in the Military History Institute. I, I still remember going to Upton Hall, so some of you still remember that. So, uh, so I, I just... I think a lot of times archivists are the unsung heroes, really, in historical scholarship. Uh, generally, historians don't, I think, really give them the due. We usually do in the acknowledgments. We're at least, at least able to do that. But uh, it's, it's, it, the debt goes so much deeper than that, and I, I want to make sure to, to give that recognition. Um, by the way, I, I'm somewhat amused by all this. I'm wearing two microphones. Uh, <laughs> if, if I assume, I'm sure some of you have, have worn those headsets in the back seats of MRAPs and Humvees. You know, those, I remember when I did that in Iraq when I worked for the State Department, it was always comical. Sort of sitting in this $2 million vehicle and the headsets would always, sometimes they were too tight, sometimes they were too loose, sometimes the cords didn't fit right. It was, it was sort of, I, I see some smiles uh, in the audience. It was just sort of, it was sort of curious. But always, it was always interesting, you know, you'd, you'd hear NCOs talk about what they really thought about their officers. You know, I, I mean, I, and I would, just, you know, I would just stay quiet in the back of the truck. So, but, Anyhow, but I, I'm sort of, uh, but it lets me move around, so, so I'll, I'll adjust. Okay, um, obviously this, 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 is, uh, this is based on a book, you know, which uh, Mike was so graciously, you know, you know, I don't have to flag it, he did it for me, right? So um, behind every book usually there's, there's a little bit of a story, and I want to, to, to talk a little bit about uh, the case of my project, which originally was a dissertation at the University of Virginia uh, under the direction of uh, Drs. Uh, Gary Gallagher and Ed Ayers. Uh, I always had an interest in military history, um, uh, and I don't, I don't like it. When, I don't think it's very useful when military historians complain about how we're maybe not the most respected group amongst academics, but the reality is, you know, if you want to get a job in, in modern American universities, doing military history generally isn't, isn't your, your quickest path to success. Um, and, uh, and so when I went into grad school, um, although, as many of you know, Dr. Gallagher is sort of the preeminent authority in the Army of Northern Virginia, which was very, and was very supportive of this topic, as was Dr. Ayers, um, I think I was sort of originally inclined, I was maybe a bit conditioned, not because I wanted a job and I wanted to eat after I graduated too. So, uh, and, and I'll be honest. And 9-11 and hit and I realized, well, maybe, you know, war, wars do kind of matter, right? I mean, it's <laughs> uh, state-sanctioned violence has a role in, in American history. Uh, so I started looking for a military topic, and I, I can't remember if it was either I or, or Dr. Gallagher who, who first came up with the, with the idea of a, of a topic involving West Pointers. Uh, but where we started out with, with, with the sort of intuitive sense, I'm sure many of you already have, that West Pointers are important. And statistically, that confirms that. 
roughly two thirds of general officers uh, of major general and above, I, you know, division and corps commanders, uh, are West Pointers, or actually really regular army veterans, right? And I'm, I'm using the two somewhat synonymously because West Point had a crucial institutional role in the army. If you want numbers, uh, shortly before the Civil War, about two thirds of, of, of regular army officers are, are West Point commissioned. But of course you have some from other commissioning sources out there. But in terms of institutions, West Point's the most important. Uh, this is an astonishing ratio, especially when you think that West Point was such a small organization, maybe only 40 to 50 cadets in each graduating class every year. So it seemed intuitive, you know, surely this is important. Right? But of course it's not enough to, to say, well, there's lots of West Pointers, okay. <laughs> you know, so, you know so, so they all had to go through the Sayre system. Well, what's it, what are the implications of that? So what, what I was hoping to do with my book was to answer that crucial question, which I think most scholarship, at least the best scholarship should answer, that so what question. Why does this matter? All right. And I hit the wrong buttons. Uh, there we go. Okay. Oh, shoot. There we go. Okay. I'm obviously technologically challenged, as is befitting a 19th century historian. All right, so, uh, so the, the so what for me is, is that then led to sort of, um, the first question is really the most important, I think, uh, here, and that is why does the war last as long as it does? Uh, and the, the argument I'm gonna make is that the common institutional backgrounds of both sets of army leaderships, both Union and Confederate, is, is what helps lead to what I call sort of an equilibrium of competence that leads to the war lasting longer. And then that leads to the, the two sort of, uh, leads to a related question, how is it fought? All right, and I'll, I'll go into that in some detail later. And why does the war end when it ends? All right, and that, I think that, that there's a crucial uh, role where uh, we, we nowadays we use this jargony term, war termination. Right? This, is, this, is part, this is related to that common institutional, bureaucratic, cultural, organizational background uh, that you can use the shorthand of West Point to symbolize, all right? And that, that's what, why this makes uh, this, what otherwise might be just an interesting factoid, you know, who knew, into something of actual historical significance. All right, the length. Uh, I'll let you read this, all right? Okay. I mean, I, I hate it when people do PowerPoint presentations when the guy just reads the slides. So, um, and there, you know, there's no fancy animations, you know, there's, there's no death by PowerPoint. But the, this, is, this is Lincoln, I'll let you, I'll, I'll give you 20 seconds. Right? I'll, just, I'll just be quiet, let you concentrate. Okay, so. Uh, this is from the second inaugural, it's from the end of the war when Lincoln is, uh, as many of you, probably most of you know, is, is, most of you do probably know this, if you didn't have an interest in the Civil War you wouldn't be here. Uh, maybe the distance education people might be the exceptions, right? But, uh, I'm just joking, but uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, no, no ins insult men, that was just, that was just, uh, that was a stupid joke, I, I'm already digging a deeper hole for myself. All right. Uh, at the, at the beginning of the war, the war is a war for union. Right? Uh, slavery is the best illustration of this. Uh, if the war had ended in 1861 or 1862, uh, especially 61, let's say the war ends at Bull Run, that's the counterfactual I have up there. It's very, very possible that slavery would have survived, especially in those states, such as Kentucky, such as Maryland, that stay in the union, that do not secede. Um, uh, it, I think it's historically very ambiguous. If you, for example, you look at uh, slavery in the state of the southern colonies after the American Revolution, slavery goes through huge amounts of trauma to all the chaos that you see in places like South Carolina because of the partisan campaigns involving Francis Merriam. Slavery survives. Slavery is actually a very survival institution. Um, and remember that it, it takes the 13th Amendment to finally, to finally end slavery legally, and in fact in places like Kentucky. So, uh, what the point of this is that the, the war's length is, is connected to many of the, its most important effects. Uh, if the war had ended in 61, 62, you wouldn't have had the massive conscription you have, even in the Confederacy that doesn't begin until the spring of 1862, uh, and, and later in the case of, of the Union. 
uh, the, in terms of mobilization of economic resources also, uh, things like uh, the implications for American economic development, uh, especially with regards to things like railroads. And off go, I'm probably, you know, the last point is arguably the, the most important one, which is how many fewer Americans would have died. Right? The, 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 the wars, massive death toll, you know, 600,000 plus, is obviously very closely related to its length. So for me, uh, uh, what, what, is the, uh, what causes this? What causes the inability to find a swift decision to the war is significant. Right? Uh, and it's, a, it's, and, and it's partly a question, I mean, obviously historians have uh, uh, dealt with this in different ways, but I was taking the military slice of the question. Right? Again, to take a quote from Lincoln, and I'll read this one because it's a little shorter. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends. This is also from the second inaugural. Right. Lincoln doesn't talk about military events. He, he does this partly to say, well, I'm not going to talk about it. But it's not because it isn't important. It's because he knows everyone's already following the military side of the story in the papers. And he knows it's so important that he doesn't need to talk about it. Right. And, and if we look at the military slice of this problem, what makes the war last as long as it does? It's obviously related to this question of indecisiveness. So what do we mean by that? All right. um, indecisiveness, if you, if you look at, when, when military historians tend to look at decisiveness, especially with regards to the Civil War, they look back to the Napoleonic Wars, and they think of a battle like Jena Auerstadt or Austerlitz, where in one blow, a war is decided. Now, for those of you who know a lot about Napoleonic campaigns, this is actually problematic, because it, it, it decides one discrete war. But if you take the Napoleonic Wars as a whole, of course, these, this thing lasts for a very long time. Um, but it, 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 is, it is a salient, important thing, especially when you look at these early battles like Bull Run. You know, why doesn't the war end in one single climactic battle early in the war? Right. And the, the argument I'm going to make is going to be it's related to the common institutional backgrounds of these armies. Lots of different explanations have been given for this. Uh, I give one at the top, an alternate that other historians have used, modernization. Right. What do I mean by modernization? It's a sort of this abstract, uh, sort of social scientific concept historians have used, this idea that both the, the North and the South, both the Union and the Confederacy, are modern nation states. Uh, they are nationalists. They believe in uh, um, their uh, rights to self-determination. Okay? And therefore, they're, because the population is plugged into these larger national causes, they're willing to make greater sacrifices for it. And this is obviously will cause a war to last a longer period of time because people are willing to sacrifice more and fight longer and fight harder. And this is true for both sections. I think there's some truth to this explanation. Um, you can trace some of this to go back, usually historians do, to the, the French Revolution when you have warfare becomes a public phenomenon outside of small professional armies. Uh, they become expanded to, to populations as a whole. Yes, that obviously occurs with the Union and the Confederacy. But for me, it's still an insufficient explanation. It's not adequate to really explain. Because you do have, um, uh, although, although that's true, I think you also have to look at sort of what happens in the military side in concrete terms. Especially because you can look at points in the war when the war might have ended early. Um, I think in 1861 at, at Bull Run, if there was a decisive federal victory, that would have been problematic for the Confederate cause of independence. My own mentor at Virginia has talked about the importance of the seven days. Uh, because at the point of the seven days in the summer of 1862, McClellan's forces are within striking range of Richmond, and a contingent event occurs that pushes them, uh, pushes them uh, as, as many of you know, Lee pushes McClellan back and their Confederacy is saved, which, uh, which breaks Union momentum that has been building uh, uh, up until the spring of 62 after Bull Run. Uh, the other explanation sometimes given for, for indecisiveness is the increased defensive power of the rifle musket combined with field works. Um, I don't want to go into this in too much detail. It's a little bit maybe I fear too much inside baseball for an audience like this. Uh, but to summarize, uh, another historian by the name of Earl Hess has actually written a book about this. The rifle musket is more lethal. Uh, its effective range is around 300 yards versus 100 yards of a smooth bore, which would have been used in the Napoleonic period. So the argument a lot of times is, well, because uh, infantry have greater firepower, this makes the defensive more potent and therefore causes it more difficult to obtain a decisive decision, which is by nature un, you know, offensive and aggressive. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, from what we know of a lot of Civil War battles, 
because of smoke, obscuration by smoke and terrain features. Usually you don't have clear fields of fire at 300 yards. Also, to actually hit something at 300 yards at a rifle musket, you have to have usually either training or talent, and the reality is most Civil War soldiers don't have that. Um, so these are not optimum conditions. Right? I mean, an M4 theoretical range is what some of, some of you, well, you know, it's arguably farther than what you know, is usually done in normal conditions because of smoke and terrain and obscuration, things like that. Uh, also, whether or not field works is, uh, um, you know, Hess has made an argument too, which I draw a lot on, that much of the, when, when soldiers entrench, they don't entrench because of this rifle musket that has more defensive firepower. They entrench because they're in close contact with an opposing army. And this is more an issue to do with geographical positioning of respective armies than it does with, with, a, with a firearm. Right. So, so for me, those are inadequate explanations, or in the case of, of the rifle musket thing, probably, in my opinion, at least dead wrong. Uh, a lot of people disagree with me on that. All right. So the slice, the, the thing I'm trying to focus on is this common background. So what does this common background result in? Um, you have this uh, equilibrium where you have both armies, because they come from the same institutional structure at the beginning of the war, and that common structure is going to allow them to learn at similar paces. It means that they'll have roughly comparable levels of competence. And so it means that they start out about a roughly similar level of competence and they learn at roughly similar rates. Now, I'm making various assumptions here, which I think are fairly supportable. One, that the raw material of the soldiers are about comparable. You know, I, I don't buy into any thesis that northerners are superior or southerners are superior. I think they're all more or less the same. Okay? Uh, and therefore, this, this, uh, this equilibrium stays in place. Because you have this rough comparable parity in operational competence, this is what helps cause the war to last as long as it does. Because sometimes you do get an advantage, of course. And a lot of times that advantage is actually in the form of a superior general. Right? I think Robert E. Lee is a much better, gen better general than George B. McClellan. So Lee obviously wins against George B. McClellan. But because his institution, his, the superior comes in the individual command, but that can only take one so far. That's why Lee is never able to utterly crush the Army of the Potomac the way he wishes to do at the Seven Days. He's successful at the Seven Days, but it's not quite what he wants. Right? And Lee isn't able to go as, he, even at, at the Second Manassas, he's not able to completely annihilate the Union Army the way Napoleon was at, uh, with the Prussians when he fought them at Yenaurstadt. So that differential is limited because it's only in the superiority of the peculiarities of the general, and it's not institutional. So that's what helps cause the war as long as it does. And, and it puts a heavy premium on this question of how. How is the war fought right, at, at sort of this ground level? Uh, this is related. To, what you see here is a, this is a page, these are two pages from Hardy's famous Light Infantry Manual, which is sort of the standard for the Civil War. This is from uh, How to Deploy Skirmishers, which is on the right. Uh, basically, uh, the little dots are individual soldiers, and you see how this is how an open order skirmish line is deployed. Right. This is part of that how. This is the common heritage that both armies have. This is a representative. It also helps explain why these West Pointers are so important. West Pointers, the regular army at the opening of the Civil War, the U.S. Army is all about a little over 16,000 officers and men. It's really, for the most part, a socially marginal institution. So it raises the question. Well, if it's such a marginal institution, why, does it, why are West Pointers then placed in such important positions of power? Especially when you look at a place like the North, because of debates over Northern war aims, West Pointers are, tend to be Democrats, they tend to be conservatives, little c conservatives, meaning they tend to be skeptical about emancipation. George B. McClellan is the most famous example of this. Right? So you've got a lot of radical Republicans who don't like them for these reasons. But they're stuck with them. Why are they stuck with them? Well, because this is, they're the only people who know how to do this at the beginning of the war. Right. So you, you can say, you know, I, you know, I believe in freedom and the citizen soldier and all this happy stuff, but someone has to know how to do this. And the reality is the only people who do are people who've been in the regular army. So, so th this is that institutional legacy that, that becomes of such crucial importance. Uh, that's on the tactical side. I have here, just as illustration, this is actually from the 63 regulations, but uh, uh, my book actually begins, believe it or not, with 1814. I talk about the post-war of 1812 
uh, professionalization of the Army. If anyone wants to hear more about that, I can do that in the question and answer period. I didn't think I had enough time to really delve into that. But these are, this is, uh, for those of you who've dealt with military bureaucracy, you have Winfield Scott to thank. For, I mean, some of this stuff you sort of have in the Blue Book earlier. But it's really in that period after the War of 1812 where you have a lot of administrative standardization. And what the form of that is sometimes things like this, which are common forms. Blanks, they would call them back in this period. All right. Why are these important? All right. It's not just to make uh, you know, staff officers' lives miserable, although they probably did do that at times. All right. It's to uh, build that administrative and bureaucratic capacity that allows an army to function, that allows an army to feed itself, to supply itself. These are all crucial things. In the context of the old army, the army before the Civil War, it was the challenge of, 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 uh, of equipping and supplying an army that fought on the Indian frontier with very primitive infrastructure. That institution structure needs to be scaled up radically when you get to the Civil War to, to man these gigantic citizen soldier armies. So people like Montgomery Meigs, who is the quartermaster general of the, US, uh, of, of the Union Army, he comes from the regular army background. Uh, the famous Josiah Gorgas, head of the Ordnance Bureau from the Confederates, he also comes from an old US Army background. Right? They have that administrative capacity that will allow these armies to feed, equip, supply themselves. Right? This is all the sort of the, the, uh, the crucial and frequently unglamorous business of, of logistics. And it, it requires bureaucracy. It requires a kind of uh, organizational efficiency that cannot be found anywhere else in the United States. The one other place that can be found in large part are railroads. But railroads themselves are very heavily influenced by military organization because many of the engineers who are trained at West Point end up being railroad rep. George M. McClellan is one. All right. So this is another crucial venue where, where, where West Point has provided this crucial expertise, uh, and, and which is important. I do want to make a caveat. You should not take from this talk, and you'll see this, I think, in the book, uh, if you read it. Um, just buy it. You know, I, I, you know, I'd like you to read it, too. But you know, if, if you can only meet me halfway, buy it, buying it is enough. Uh, it would be like my students then, right? Uh, uh, but um, actually, they, don't, they, they won't even read stuff that I assign from other people who are famous. I, they would never read my stuff, so I don't even bother to, to assign it. Uh, but, the, re the reality is, as I said, the Union Army is all of 16,000 men. I mean, most, most of these West Pointers don't have any experience with major field commands. The closest is Winfield Scott, who conquers Mexico City with an army around 13, 14,000, sometimes less. Right? Th this, is, this is a fraction of the size of McDowell's 35,000 at first bull run. Right? And Scott is the only guy who's, who's sort of done that at the point, and he can't take the field anymore because because he's grown so old and, and a, little, a little portly by that point in his career. All right, I'm being gentle. He's a great, great general, but I, I'm being a little generous there. So, I, you know, the West Pointers really don't, I mean, they, they, don't, have much, they don't have much experience with, with supplying armies of this vast size. Right? They, they, uh, their large unit experience is extremely deficient. Uh, even sometimes their lower level experience is deficient. But the reality is they know more than everyone else. Uh, so it's sort, of, it's sort of like the story of uh, the, the one-eyed man in the, the land of the blind is still a king. I mean, that's basically where these West Pointers come in. Is they, they have the ability to scale up. They, they start from something as opposed to nothing. And the reality is that most Americans, uh, because of the decline of the militia system, and the United States just doesn't fight very many large wars before the Civil War, if you exclude the Revolution, which of course is by that time irrelevant to people's personal experience, there is no, no military experience really. Even the Mexican War is war fought in large part by U.S. regulars. So, and and that scale, the scale of that is also so small that it's not going to have a tremendous amount of, of significance. All right. The last point to answer the so what question right, uh, is how the war ends. Right. Uh, I will actually read a little bit here just because I don't want to put the whole quote. I think it's deserved. This is, this is from uh, Porter Alexander's uh, memoirs of the Civil War. Basically, the, the war is lost, and he, Alexander was, was artillery chief of the, of the Army of Northern Virginia's first corps. Alexander sort of uh, gives, uh, proposes a guerrilla strategy, you know, to, to basically have all the, the soldiers take their muskets and go into the bush and do their thing to prolong the conflict, because he's obviously unhappy with, with the idea of Yankee domination. 
uh, or what he would have seen as that. This is Lee's response, according to Alexander. The men would have no rations, and they would be under no discipline. They are already demoralized by four years of war. They would have to plunder and rob to procure subsistence. The country would be full of lawless bands in every part, and a state of society would ensue from which it would take the country years to recover. And as for myself, while you men might afford to go to bushwhacking, the only proper and dignified course for me would be to surrender myself and take the consequences of my actions. Right. And Alexander then promptly shuts up. Right. It's a great story of Lee, because it's just sort of that wonderful way that Lee knew how to of rebuking people without, you know, in a way that was gentle but really stung all the more. Right? Um, and this is part of that heritage that the regular army bequeaths. That has significance to the war. Uh, some of you may know of Daniel Sutherland's great recent book, uh, Savage Conflict, which is about uh, um, sort of uh, guerrilla war during the Civil War, where Sutherland points out all the problems, uh, that, that basically one of the big problems with an insurgent strategy for the Confederates was the fact of the uncontrollability of, of Confederate guerrillas who frequently prey on the population, commit abuses, use, use a conflict as sort of a, an excuse for plunder. And you see this especially in places like Missouri. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why that, that's, you know, it's not practical. You know, it, it's not actually that successful, that insurgent strategy is picked. But there's also a cultural reason, which is that the people in charge of the Confederate armies, in this case, Lee is the most important, because following Gary Gallagher's uh, thesis in the Confederate War, I think Lee becomes, in many ways, that fulcrum point of Confederate nationalism. All these guys, all these generals, come out of this regular army where for them war is something very specific. It is two groups of men, only men, in uniforms under some kind of hierarchical system of discipline fighting each other, right, according to a certain set of rules. On the margins, there can be plenty of room to debate. African American soldiers are the best example of this. Obviously, Union soldiers see them as soldiers and deserving of uh, the rights and usages according to the law of war with regards to things like prisoners. Confederates disagree and will therefore massacre African American soldiers as essentially escaped slaves in insurrection. Right? But in the broad outlines, even as the war escalates, this consensus holds. Right? And that consensus also excludes the, uh, what Alexander implicitly proposes, which is that soldiers uh, just go off into the bush and fight in these small bands under no discipline. Right? People like Lee are suspicious of that, partly because they know from experience in places like Missouri that, in, that guerrillas can become lawless. Uh, if you remember in the quote I read, there's a lot of emphasis on you know, lack of control, lack of discipline. Alexander in 1861 writes in a letter, a personal letter, complaining about not Union soldiers, but Confederate soldiers preying on the population. You know, what happens when you take all the officers away and have them all go in the bush? This is something that people like Lee do not want to do, and that's why they foreclose it. That's why they refuse that option. And for me, that's part of, of the significance of this institutional background, this cultural legacy that is bequeathed to both sections' armies. Now, obviously, on this side, it's, it's more important than the Confederate side, uh, but it still helps determine. So, so for me, there's kind of an ironic twist at the end. Right, what I call this equilibrium of competence, this inability for one organization to find a decisive advantage over another beyond sort of marginal peculiarities with regards to individual leadership, is uh, that helps prolong the war, but that common background also helps end it. Right. Uh, and also, it, it helps on the Union side. I mean, that's part, probably part of the reason why people like Grant, or, and Sherman even, you know, despite Sherman's sort of fire-breathing rhetoric, you know, He's able to make these bargains with his Confederate counterparts, partly because he knows these people. He knows them from the old army. He still sees them, in some sense at least, both Grant and Sherman, as Americans. And therefore, they can, they can despite being on different sides, they can, make, uh, they can make those agreements regarding parole and surrender that help bring the war uh, to a real close. So with that, I will, uh, I will defer to questions, which I think Mr. Lynch will moderate for me.
give to the back that the South had cotton that they could sell abroad and finance their, their war effort as contributing to the duration of the war. The uh, cotton is, is an interesting phenomenon because before the war, uh, the Confederate leader, people who become the Confederate leaders, Southern nationalists for lack of a better term, uh, believe that cotton is the crucial lever they can use to force the British to intervene on their side because British textile mills are so dependent on southern cotton. This doesn't really matter for a variety of reasons. Actually, huge bumper crops of cotton right before the Civil War, so they're actually fairly large stockpiles in Great Britain. Also, the Confederacy actually misplays it to some degree. Uh, the Confederacy puts an embargo in an effort to persuade the British to come in, the Confederate says, well, we're not going to send you any cotton, you know, unless, you, unless you recognize us and shell New York and do other happy things to help us, uh, give us guns and things like that. And uh, for the reasons I previously mentioned, that there are big stocks of cotton already around, and the British are also don't. I mean, no, no, group, no country takes lightly to these kinds of threats. So it, it, cotton is seen by, by uh, white Southerners before the war as a great potent weapon. It ends up actually being not that that they're able to still use it and export it and sometimes trade it for hard currency to buy weapons. But cotton ends up actually not helping the Confederacy. You know, I don't want to do all that much. Perhaps this is your next book, but who were the North sort of officers that did not come to West Point and what, if anything, did, did they know if they didn't know the field names? Yeah. Uh, I, I need to emphasize something is that there, there's nothing as good as experience. So the volunteers catch up awfully fast. Right? And this actually becomes a problem arguably later in the war uh, where the, the West Pointers are put in these senior positions partly because they have a head start. But I mean, John Logan is a great example. Uh, a lot of times they pick, up, pick it up through experience. I mean, they'll, they'll study the manual in the camp and then they'll figure it out on the fly. Uh, and a lot of times it's, you know, the stupid ones get killed and, and, and the, the smart ones stay on, right? So, and become very proficient. So, but the West Pointers are always a bit jealous of, of keeping their prerogatives. And sometimes it's based more on, Logan's actually a great example because, because Sherman has a, uh, he, sort of amidst this in, in his personal correspondence, that, well, you know, he's a great, he's a, he's a good general. But he's not a West Pointer, so yeah, it's not quite the same. Yeah. So, and, and Sherman, I think, was a bit more flexible. I mean, Sherman didn't worship West Point the way some of his colleagues did. I mean, if you look at his some course correspondence, uh, McClellan is appointed. Sherman points out, you know, McClellan doesn't have a lot of field experience. He's a really smart guy. He has a lot of professional credentials. But let's see how he does in the field. So, uh, so, you know, the the armies. Uh, the, the, the mass of people who come from daily life, who come from, you know, their newspaper editors, their college graduates, uh, and of course the soldiers come from that rank and file of American society, they learn very fast. Uh, but they have, to, but when they come into the service, they have to start from somewhere. A lot of times what they start with is that institutional background I'm talking about here. But there becomes a mismatch because as they advance, and a lot of the West Pointers will advance, of course, with them. Right? But there becomes sometimes a mismatch where the citizens and soldiers are farther ahead and the West Pointers are not always willing to admit that. Right? But you also have to remember in the Union Army, both armies, not just, especially the Union Army arguably, are, are both uh, inherit the, the regular army's tenacious belief in seniority to the point of having these absurd situations like uh, during the Overland Campaign, Burnside's Corps has to report directly to Grant because he's technically senior to me. So Burnside outranks me? You know, I mean, this, does this actually make sense? No. But, but it, that's the story. And even Grant is sort of imprisoned by that. I mean, Grant's actually a pretty common sense to go general, but even he's. And it, it leads to strange coronation problems during the Overland campaign. And that seniority, because of that seniority, who are all the early general officers and colonels, even? They're West Pointers. Because who else were you going to promote in 1861? Right? So that, that, you're going to see that issue, and they end up being the corps commanders and division commanders at the end of the war. Thank you. 
Yeah, th this is, um, uh, you're, you're very right, this, this first part. part. Part of this problem is actually institutional. This is part of the limitations of, of the old army. Uh, the old army has no provisions for the kind of uh, chief of staff figure who would have, or general staff that would have responsibility for overall strategic planning. Right? Even Grant, who has that conception, his famous strategy of, of concurrent simultaneous pressure, what does Grant end up having to do? He has to go to the Army of Potomac and lead it in the field. Well, arguably what he should be doing is, is stay in Washington and coordinate all the different forces. But American uh, command structure just hasn't evolved really to, to the point where, where this, is, this is a plausible outcome. And it, and it really does bedevil um, um, the, both, both war efforts, arguably. Uh, I, I, you're also definitely right, uh, the Confederacy is, is a vast, uh, the Confederacy is about the size, I think, of Western Europe, maybe even a little larger than that. These are vast distances. There are also, uh, if you use the European comparison, it's also significant because the road infrastructure in the United States is comparably, uh, is, is not as good. Also, the population density is much lower. So the ability of armies to feed themselves is much more limited. This is why actually American field armies are smaller than Napoleonic field armies. Because, or frequently smaller, if you compare it to things like, like what you have at Leipzig or something like that, where you have hundreds of thousands of men under, in each army. It's because they, you couldn't feed an army that size in the American context, even with things like railroads. I mean, the, it's the, sort of the tyranny of distance. Uh, and, and this does give the Confederacy, this is, the, this is the, the, what balances the Confederacy for, um, the Union has tremendous superiority, as everyone knows, in manpower, economic resources. But the Confederacy has space, has strategic depth. All right, it has a, so it, it's the, the United States, the, Fed, the rump United States, the federal government has to conquer, has more resources, but it also has a very challenging task. And much of this is logistical, uh, of, of having to conquer the space. And arguably, it takes four years for them to figure this out. Uh, it, but eventually, obviously, it does happen. Thank you. Um, I Me, myself, I'm very interested in bringing the social sciences into history and that interdisciplinarity. So my question is this. Um, when you were writing your dissertation or your book, did you draw any ideas or theories from, the, from sociology, from business management, organizational science, any of those areas? Which ones were helpful? You know, th that's a great question, and um, I may be a little bashed to say, not really. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I will say, I mean, there, there definitely is, uh, you know, there's a whole field of military sociology. Uh, you know, most of it, most of it sort of post-World War II. Uh, SLA Marshall, which some of you know of, sort of important work on combat motivation, things like that. So I, I, think, I think historians have, uh, for, for me, the most influential book on, on professionalization was uh, I guess Bill Skelton and Sam Huntington. Sam Huntington is a political scientist, so that would be the closest thing. Although, although real social scientists would point out that book was written in the 50s. But, uh, so, uh, but I think like most historians, I, I suppose I'm just not as fluid with those methods. Um, I, I think uh, if any of you are interested, uh, Isabel Hull's book, uh, Absolute Destruction, which is actually on the German army, uh, in, sort of the, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, actually I think an example of a book which aspires to what you're trying, what you're pointing out, because uh, she's much, she's truly read into the sociological literature, uh, and I have not. You know? and, and that's partly because I'm a 19th century Americanist, so you don't have quite as much, uh, you don't have as quite as much cross fertilization uh, on that. I mean, things like modernization theory and things like that is, is, uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know enough about it to be comfortable using it. Or though, though one could, could make the argument I should have. Good thing you weren't on my dissertation committee. <laughs> yes, sir. PD student from the great Confederate state of Georgia. Uh, did, did you add any credence to uh, your point that you haven't taken them very well? Any credence to that due to the, the level of uh, expertise and tactical experience of the southern West Pointers because of internal disputes, Indian disputes, border disputes? And the vast, vast amount of force compared to the northern states, northern states, that that, is, that maybe explains some of the early wins in the south for the first few years, and then kind of got an even playing field. Uh, I guess 
my, my, my response to that would be to look really at the Western theater, where, where, uh, where the Confederate leadership is, is utterly, does not do very well, right? I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I, I, I would say the, the regular army before the war is, is a very, it's actually the most national of institutions, really, in the United States. Out on the frontier, officers frequently shed as, as to a greater degree as is possible in this period in the United States, much of their, their local identities. They don't completely, I mean, that's why a lot of them go Confederate, most of them do. But a, a substantial minority of, of even Southern, uh, um, Southern born West Point graduates actually stay with the Union Army. George Thomas is probably the most famous, uh, who's, who's from Virginia, and who actually does that at a tremendous personal cost. I mean, there's those great stories of his family being infuriated at him, you know, the portrait of him and his family home being turned the other side around, you know, that, who knows if these stories are right or not, but they're, they're, they're great, so I'll just give them anyways. You know, of, uh, you know the, the, the Union Army officers who show up you know, as sisters out of courtesy to, to them because of, of, her, of her brother with supplies and, and their icy reply, you know, our brother is dead, you know, things like that. So, uh, so it, it's, it's actually, I, I really, um, I think certainly there is an edge uh, with the Confederacy and grudge with things like cavalry. And then there's a reverse edge, arguably, with artillery, right? Sort of northern uh, mechanics are more used to this kind of synchronized mechanical uh, actions. Uh, that larger uh, aristocratic culture is probably lends itself to cavalry superiority. But these things, over the course of war, they all even out. Right? I mean, I think Confederate artillery figures it out by experience. And Union, or Union cavalry figures it out. It takes a long time. And also, some of this is individuals. I mean, Part of the reason you have better Confederate cavalry in the Army of Northern Virginia is because you have Jeb Stewart. All right? And all, who are all the no-name guys on the Union side? George Stillman. Who cares about George Stillman? You know, so, uh, you, know, so you, you have these, you know, so some of that differential is from, from individuals, I would say. So I, I really, in all honesty, don't, um, don't put a lot of credence on, on sectional. You know, some, we used to sometimes think that Southerners were rural, so they had more familiarity with firearms. But the North in this period is also extremely rural, too. I mean, a lot of Northerners have familiarity with firearms also. Uh, and use of firearms in a military context is different than a hunting context, too. So there's that, there's that differential also. It, uh, um, just to clarify, you were, you were talking about if Lee ended up being the primary federal field commander at the beginning of the war. That, that's actually a good, um, a good counterfactual. I guess what I might say in reply to that is, is I want to, I think I would have to, 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 to clarify that. I do think individuals matter, right? So you have lots of different lines of causation. And if you had a, a markedly superior federal field commander at that point who won the Battle of Bull Run, then then that would override the institutional stuff I'm talking about. And I couldn't, I couldn't write this book, basically. Right? It would be irrelevant. Uh, that being said, I also point out, though, that Lee's early field command experience doesn't go that well right, in West Virginia. I mean, Lee, even Lee, ha this is part of the problem, the challenge at all of these. I mean, Lee is obviously a natural in many ways, but if you look at his early experience, it's, it's, it's also problematic, partly because he's never done it before. Right, and that West Virginia experience, I think, is very valuable because he sort of learns what armies can and, and cannot do, uh, as opposed to what Scott's smaller veteran force could do in Mexico. I mean, I think Lee is, is perhaps a bit deceived by his own experience. Also, Lee is a staff officer at that point, a very talented one, but not, not in the commander's shoes. So even if we reverse it as you do, I, think, I don't think it's a guarantee that Lee, Lee, you know, Lee would have won. I would say that you know, if, if I was a betting man, Although the Federals could have had a victory at Bull Run, I think that's certainly within the realm of possibility, arguably the most likely outcome is something of a stalemate, which is sort of what happens. The Federals are decisively defeated, but not really. The Federal Army doesn't runs, but the Confederates can't really exploit that because they're too disorganized themselves, because they're too raw. You know, these are two armies that fundamentally don't have the competence for that quick knockout blow. So you're gonna, probably going to have a situation where they both sort of vaguely survive, which is probably good for Confederate independence. Yeah, 
Wayne. I, one of the common threads when you read the memoirs of senior Confederate generals is this lament about the lack of quality staff officers in the Confederate Army. So my question is more about the death of the West Pointers and the two armies. Uh, you talked about the importance of this West Point education in, in staffing and, and resourcing these, these, these armies. Did that, because I guess the lack of depth of West Pointers in the Confederate Army, if it is true, I think I think there definitely is. On their hand, I, I also think that um, I, I want to also distinguish though between the, the supply administrative staffs and the operational staffs. Right? Both armies have the advantage of the administrative staffs because they inherit the, reg the regular army's administrative staff is actually pretty good. It's pretty good because it has to be because otherwise it couldn't supply. I mean, the army is very small. It's dispersed on frontier posts. Their infrastructure is wretched. Congress doesn't want to spend any money. So it, it makes do with what it does and does very good at that. But there's no, there's no strong, American operational staffs are terribly immature. They're, they're, they're not even close to what even Napoleon has with the, you know, or the French have with the Etat Major, things like that. There's some American awareness of it. Uh, um, Lee, Lee has some conception of it. But the, the operational staffs are weak. And, um, and part of it is that lack of depth. But there's also other factors. I mean, in the case of Lee, for example, Lee keeps his staff artificially small. Uh, he doesn't want to be seen as having this overly glamorous headquarters family of, of uh, so he probably keeps it too small. Um, but also the problem is institutionally there's not a, a strong American tradition of that. So I think that, that feeds into some of the problems with, uh, especially with large unit coordination. You see at places like even late in the war, even as late as 1864, where, where you have a lot of defects there. It certainly would have helped, though, if you, I think if you had a, a deeper bench. I mean, this is the, the struggle that the armies have. They, they don't have. You also have the competition between quality commanders for staff officers. A. Humphreys becomes a great chief of staff for the Army of the Potomac, but he really wants a line command. You know, this is a perennial problem that never goes away. So, uh, but that, that certainly is. Uh, but I, I will say that I think for Confederate logistics, I think the Confederacy really, in all honesty, on the supply side does okay. The problem with the Confederacy really is that they have fewer supplies in the first place. Right? I mean, their supply situation is in inherently bad because the Confederacy has less stuff. Its railroad infrastructure is terrible. You know, if you look at guys like Gorgas, he, he, you know, he works wonders with what he has. Uh, Red Shirt. Uh, on the same sort of theme, uh, I think there may be a case to be made for your argument uh, of equivalency uh, at the general officer field commander level. But it's certainly not true at the level that was just being talked about, the level of the staff. Uh, the Union Army troop did not have operations officers and intelligence officers. But they had what we would nowadays call special staff officers, and they had bunches of them. And most of them West Pointers that had the, the bureaus of Union Army were controlled entirely by West Pointers uh, with lots of experience. And the number of those officers, and we're talking middle managers now, majors, lieutenant colonels, captains, the number of those uh, Union officers that went over to the South were infinitesimal in comparison uh, to the combat. And I think you will find that this argument for equivalency falls down when you look at the far superior staff work of the Union Army in terms of quartermaster, uh, medical service, pay, uh, rations, and the whole, the whole raft of it. Uh, one of Lee's problems, of course, was that about half the time he couldn't feed or, or supply ammunition for his army. It, in the quantities needed at the places needed uh, when he wanted. Uh, by the end of the war, the Union Army has pretty much resolved these things. So that, that thing about the equivalency needs to be looked at, not at the level of major generals above, as you define it, but probably 
be a lower level. I, I, I absolutely agree that the uh, core master core of the Union Army is probably better. That being said, I will, uh, I will, my reply will, will also be this. In the winter of 62, scurvy breaks out in the Union Army. Right. You know, uh, also, so I, I think there's still a lot of learning to be done on the federal side. Also, the thing is, I would also say that while the, the supply administrative core, I think, in the, in the northern armies is better, its logistical task is also more challenging in the, because of precisely this problem of distance. It's the army that has to invade. Uh, uh, and, and this, so they've got a harder job. So for me, as, as sort of causal importance, that sort of washes it out if you're talking about this issue of what, what's the causality behind uh, what, what prolongs the war. Uh, on the Confederate side, I think it's certainly true that the Confederate supply services could have been better, but the Confederate, I, I want to emphasize again, the Confederates have inherent systemic problems from things like railroad stock that's going bad. Uh, there are tremendous, the Confederacy is smaller, much of its uh, granary, much of its richest agricultural regions in places like the middle of Tennessee fall very early in the war. I mean, this, these are all, there, there's almost, uh, there's very little, there's no way of replacing rolling stock uh, of things like road iron, which is crucial. So th these are, uh, yes, there's obviously horrible staff work. The famous story of, of Lee uh, during the Appapattox campaign, you know, his rations are mis misplaced, so he has to, uh, he has to move accordingly. Th these things obviously do happen. Obviously, the union side is, is superior. But also, there's part of that, of that differential comes from the different social bases. You know, the, the federal side also has a lot more stuff in the first place. That always helps with supply. Uh, so that, that, gives, that gives a certain degree of edge. Um, again, I, would, I, mean, I don't want to flog him too much, but I think I mean, Gorgas is a good example. Gorgas does a lot with what's a very poor hand that's been um, and he's able to manage it. I mean, obviously people like substances and things like that, it's, that's not quite a rosy scenario. Uh, but um, uh, but I, I, I guess my argument would be that for me, oh, I'm sorry, you, you also made another important point. My argument isn't so much that the, the equilibrium is so much just at the major jungle, it's that it's more institutional, right? So it, the significance is not so much that the high command echelons are populated by West Pointers, it's that the armies are organizational clones of each other, especially on the operational and the tactical side. Right? So when they do their initial training, they train in similar ways. You know, close order tactics, some skirmish drill mixed in. All right? uh, they have similar strengths and weaknesses. All right? and, and, uh, and because they start out the similar institutional base, they learn at roughly equivalent rates. Right? Their drill masters act roughly the same and things like that. Import, they import impart similar bureaucracies to one another. So it's really that the, the, the organizations are, are, are very similar and comparable with one another. It's not, which, which is reflected in the major journals, but it's really, you know, the dissertation was titled The Old Army in War and Peace, West Pointers in the Civil War Era. That's a better title, but it doesn't sell as many books according to my press. Okay, so, uh, so I mean, that, that's kind of, it, it's probably the, the more scholarly specific title. Dr. Summers, that's a, that's a great question, and I, I really kind of 
wish I, I had thought of it, but <laughs> before I wrote the book, because that's something, it's like actually an avenue of inquiry I did not really, I did not really use and probably should have used. Uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, we, uh, related to that, one, I'll, I'll say this. I think, we don't know, as, I think, as much about st Civil War staffs as we really should. Uh, there's sort of one study, I can't remember the author of it right now. I thought it was sort of, it was sort of an okay book. It was, it's probably the author sitting here, it's probably all, you know, <laughs> good throw. Rotted tomato at me right now, but uh, uh, and, you know. So uh, this, there, there's arguably a bit of a deficit of knowledge uh, uh, looking at this system systematically. But also, this is we all know. I talked about the Mexican War a bit, but I, th I think there's a historian who wrote the Mexican War rehearsal for conflict, right? And you can chronicle all these West Pointers who show up in the Mexican War. Okay, but we haven't really. I think historians haven't drawn and this may be a criticism of my own work, haven't drawn as effectively what exactly are that lines of causality between the Mexican War and the Civil War. And I think that actually might be a, a, a crucial one. Because at, at that position on a staff, uh, you have the potential of, although obviously uh, that young uh, junior officer is not going to be in a position of command, but it will be in a position to observe, right? And to be able to see especially how large unit operations are, are figuring. Uh, as opposed to the West Pointer in charge of a company where the world is, is sort of dealing with that immediate action in front of oneself, right? But that, of course, deprives that, that, that individual of, of a sense of what the bigger picture is. And that's what's so chronically missing during the Civil War is that Civil War officers don't have experience with the bigger picture because how could they have it? They come out of this tiny army that fights Indians for most of its time, right? So uh, learning at, you know, Seeing Scott in action by itself, or Worth, or you know, or a division commander, I think has to have given what limited. Uh, it, uh. Also, remember that there are no um, the the American the PME structure is very primitive by our standards, right? So they go to West Point. At West Point, they learn how to be junior officers of artillery, cavalry, and infantry. That's really all, and they and they learn how to be great engineers in BH Mahan's class. Uh, they get very little strategic education. There's no mill art or anything like that. Right? And then they go into the regular army where their day-to-day -day experience is at the company level generally. So, or maybe building a fortification. So they, they don't have a, a huge amount of exposure to, to real campaigns outside of singular experiences like Mexico. But this is arguably, you know, if, if there's a smart graduate student out there um, or just someone who wants to write a book, I think, I mean, something that, were, that, was, that tracks more closely, I think, the Mexican War experience than the Civil War. And more satisfactory might, might, be, might, might fill a hole in the scholarship. Doctor, thank you. Um, I've also read that not only did the uh, Southern uh, West Point graduates that moved to the Southern Army, they also had a uh, relatively good junior officer for coming out of the Southern military college VMI, especially the first half of the war. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, um, VMI is, is uh, actually of, of crucial importance. I think Richard McMurdy has actually shown that because a lot of them end up being, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia is sort of lucks out uh, because uh, it gets one, a, a big chunk of West Pointers, but it also gets a lot of VMI cadets. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't think there's, at least I'm not, I will say this, though, about the, the Southern military academies, uh, especially the ones, I mean, VMI, I, I would sort of put in a, in a special sort of higher historical significance. The, the Southern academies, obviously, someone who graduates from those institutions has a leg up because they've had some military training and indoctrination as, as, a, young, as a young student, as a young college student. But I, I also want to emphasize the, the thing is many, they, most of them lack that crucial service in the field with an actual army, which is especially important, I think, on the administrative side. You know, they've never had to fill out a morning report. They've never had to go to a post and worry about logistics with, the, with their company on the, on the frontier and things like that. So it's still also a lot of the southern military economies, very, including VMI, very self-consciously model their curriculums on West Point. But one must also remember, I think, uh, I think Jennifer Green is the one who wrote, I think, I think a dissertation, I think she's published it as a book now. A lot of the Southern military academies, one also has to point out, are not designed really to be military colleges. They're more designed to 
provide a sort of a scientific professional education to, to uh, middle class families. So VMI produces lots of school teachers and things like that. So a, a lot of it feeds into not so much wanting to train these young men for military service, but for uh, dealing with various, some of it's, uh, you know, every, every generation thinks college students are out of control. Right, so this is one, this, you know, the 19th century, this is one, and there's actually truth to that. I mean, you have places like Princeton, you know, a guy, student blows up a building with gunpowder. You know, crazy things happen, right? And military schools are seen as one way to get the young people in line, right? You know, so, you know, especially sort of southern young men who are sometimes, you know, who are seen as being somehow uncontrollable. So the discipline is designed to do that, not to make them officers per se. So, and because they also don't have the institutional, actual institutional experience, it makes them have, I, I would argue, a less of a level of, of, of military expertise. However, it, it's, still, it's still, I would say, is, is, is better than you know, the average citizen soldier officer who goes in with, with, very little, with almost no knowledge whatsoever. Uh, read that in the first year of the war there was a great deal of criticism of West Pointers. I think particularly in the South as these huge withdrawals were taking place on what seemed to frustrated civilians to be theoretical reasons about decisive points and other Jominian kind of logic. Uh, and Jefferson Davis himself came under criticism for this. Did that ever have much of an influence or was it because there was no one else yeah, it, it really is the latter point you suggest. There, there is criticism. There's criticism on both sides. Uh, the Confederacy, I would say, has less. This is less of a problem because there is that critique. You know, this idea of you know the um, you see this in uh, Mary Chestnut's memoir. This complaint about uh, West Pointers being obsessed with discipline. A lot of the early complaints about Lee. Uh, when Lee first comes in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, he orders his men to dig. One, the soldiers don't like it. It's, it's vaguely demeaning to them. What, am I slave? I'm supposed to dig you know, these trenches? And later they kind of figure it out, I think. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, but uh, you know, it's 1864, none of them are complaining about digging, right? But, um, but they're, they're, you know, and, and Lee is known as an engineer. Also, in Lee's case, there's the West Virginia campaigns, which don't go so well. But there, there is, there is a, a, a sense, there is a complaint that West Pointers are too cautious, they're too high bound by red tape, uh, they don't have enough offensive spirit. Uh, but the reality is, who else do you go to? Uh, and because of that lack of alternative. And in the case of the Confederacy, Lee's success resolves many of those, many of those problems. Uh, the other thing that a Confederacy has an important difference with is that in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Union, this friction, I think I alluded to this in the talk, begins, gets plugged into partisan politics and partisan disputes. And a lot of this comes down to George B. McClellan. George B. McClellan is a conservative Democrat. He is through and through a Union man, but he's deeply, deeply unenthusiastic about emancipation. Actually has a war strategy that sees emancipation as counterproductive as only causing further, making reunion further problematic. He wants a more conciliatory policy toward you know, the, the errant southern sisters and brothers. And, uh, and he's very vocal about this. He, he's, he doesn't hide this very much, right? And of course, word of this gets back to, uh, to so-called radical Republicans, meaning Republicans who want a more aggressive war policy, an important component of which is emancipation. Uh, and they therefore, when they start to look at West Pointers, what they see is McClellan. They see uh, McClellan, who they see as at least vaguely treasonous, perhaps, for being unenthusiastic about prosecuting the war in a vigorous way. They see all these Southern-born uh, officers who got an education at US government expense at West Point and have now gone to the Confederacy. And they see, uh, therefore, West Point is this hotbed of treason. Uh, I mean, they, they sort of forget about the, the people like George Holmes who stay in. <laughs> uh, but, but so that, that colors their view. And so for them, and the reality is, the truth is, at the, at the senior command echelons of the Army of the Potomac, it is a lot of conservative Democrats. I mean, that's, that's actually true. 
Uh, many of them will end up staying out of politics, especially when they see what happens to McClellan and his partisans. But there's truth to that, to that leaning. And a lot of this is McClellan's fault for not being very judicious about, about uh, advertising his politics or, or for advertising his politics as a whole. And this thing feeds into natural American uh, suspicions of standing armies, fears of military usurpation, uh, you know, the sense, you know, that McClellan's army is really just his bodyguard and things like that. You know, there's sort of Caesarism is seeing as potentially on the, on the, on the horizon. So that, that causes a lot of consternation in the North. But the problem is, even in the Union, who else are you going to go to? Right? I mean, are you going to sort of simply relieve all of these guys? I mean, you can take out one, you can get rid of McClellan, who, but even McClellan in the end sort of militarily hangs himself by his battlefield problem. And people like um, uh, Fitz John Porter uh, also, but also Porter also makes himself vulnerable by his, his dubious conduct during the, the second Manassas campaign. So uh, you, there, there's, it's not practical to do a wholesale relief of, of all of your corps commanders. It just, it just won't work. Uh, so what you have happening in the North, in the Union, is this, this very difficult situation where you have a big chunk of the political leadership that is deeply suspicious of the military leadership but can't get rid of them. So they're stuck with each other in this painfully, uh, uh, sort of this painfully fraught situation that's completely counterproductive and, and doesn't really help anyone. But it shows you how crucial the West Pointers are because who else are you going to go to? Now, by, arguably, by the end of the war, you do have people you can go to after that four years of experience. But 62, 63, this is, even 64, this is not the case. You're, you, you, still have to, you, know, you still have to deal with these folks. I'm gonna leave it there. Okay. I'll hear Wayne just for a second. Oh, there you go. Well, Wayne, we really appreciate your uh, take your insight on the American Civil War. As I mentioned, when we started uh, this year, we began a five-year commemoration of the history of the American Civil War. And it's so important that, uh, that, that we do that here. And we're thrilled that you've given us another perspective on the US Army. What we ask our, our speakers to do is help us understand our Army a little bit better. And you have certainly done a, a great job of that, both with, with your book and, and with your talk here tonight. We also are thrilled to, to welcome Dr. Shea back because he has done a significant amount of research here in our collections, and we're always thrilled to see the, 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 the fruit of that labor when, uh, when we're able to welcome back a speaker with a, with a completed work. So on behalf of our director, uh, Mr. Tom Hendricks, I'd like to present to you a, uh, as a small token of your, uh, your, uh, our appreciation for your talk, a, a reduced copy of your poster, and we thank you very much for all you've, uh, you've given us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.